Hello, BookTube. It's Tuesday, a hot, humid, overcast Tuesday here in Boston. Just, uh, I might as well call it Bolivia. We have we have southern Bolivia weather now, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It's autumn, at least technically. It's the first week of October, uh, but it's 97% humidity. It's going to be close to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and that is, I, I would, from the data that I have seen, I would guess that certainly the high humidity. The high humidity is here to stay where humidity in Boston never goes below 70%. Never. Uh, the last time that Boston had a run of days with humidity above 70% in a row, that run of days lasted two weeks and two days. This has been close to eight months. So I'm convinced that it's never going to change. We're never going to have a dry day again. That's why I'm, I'm wearing a different shirt, because I made the mistake of moving for one half of one minute. Uh, and ended up drenched in sweat, needing to take off that shirt, take a shower, towel off, calm down. <sighs> anyway, <laughs> is it dry? It is a wet, soggy Tuesday, and Tuesday is Tag Tuesday on Book Two, <laughs> and we—I am doing Jim's uh, alphabet tag from Jim's books and reading and stuff. Uh, I have been doing it from the beginning. Uh, I was derailed only briefly by the Q tag because I went on a rant for forty-five minutes and deleted that video and forgot to make a new one. I don't think there are any rants in the T tag, so we should be okay, because T stands for lots and lots of things. What have we got in here? Uh, Twain? TBR? T? Turkey? I might also add, T also stands for Taylor County. I'm just saying. Uh, well, let's get to the prompt, shall we? Uh, T is for Twain and Tom Sawyer. Uh, what is the importance of Tom Sawyer? I honestly don't know what this question means. Uh, I honestly don't know what this question means. Uh, Tom, the importance of Tom Sawyer as a character or the importance of Tom Sawyer as a book? Tom Sawyer is a terrific book. Uh, does it need more importance than that? It's a, it's a classic of American literature. So uh, uh, some parts of it have entered into the popular folklore of American literature, the broader American mind, the, the, the fence painting scene in Tom Sawyer. Terrific. Uh, I don't know if it needs more importance than that. I don't know quite what kind of importance is being got at here. Uh, I don't want to go out on a limb. So we'll go to uh, the next prompt, which is TBR, uh, which in booktube parlance means to be read. What are the books on your to be read pile? Uh, and Jim asks, show me your TBR. I can't really physically do that. Uh, not only because a great deal of the stuff that's on my TBR is in ebook form, but also because my TBR is not normal. <laughs> it's not normal at all. I set my I read mostly new releases uh, in the American book market in the 15 or 16 genres that I read, uh, and I read them feverishly. I read a lot of them, and I want to read a lot of them, and I can find myself to the year. So if I miss a new release from 2020. I'm not going to go back in 2021 and read it. Not Maybe a couple, but not a lot. And if a 2022 book comes to me early and looks interesting, I'm still going to leave it until 2022. Uh, but 2021, I mean, we're in early October. You'd never know it. The drag races are still going on, the explosions, the mortar fire, the pistol fire, uh, the gas-powered leaf blower people are still being shot by the police because they won't let go of their gas powered leaf blowers, even though they're pointing at concrete and have been for 10 hours. Uh, there's still a lot of the year left, <laughs> is what I'm trying to say, in between rants. What I'm trying to say is there's still a lot of the year left, a lot of books I haven't got to yet that I mean to read before the end of the year. Uh, so for the, for showing you your t my TBR, I listed a few of those that I haven't got to yet. First one is Jason Casper. It's called Covert Kill. It's the third book in his Shadow Strike series. A very good, very energetic, uh, Clancy-esque, paramilitary, or explicitly military, it's the CIA, thriller series. Uh, I'm always in the mood for a new thriller series, provided the writer can hold my attention. The thriller series, despite the name of the subgenre, can be very boring. <laughs> and this one is not. This series is not. But I haven't read uh, Covert Kill yet, uh, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, then the next one is, I think I've mentioned it on this channel before, it's called Here's to Us, uh, which is by Becky Albertalli and uh, Adam Silvestri, two best-selling YA novelists who came together to collaborate on a story about two gay boys in the big city who meet cute and maybe have a relationship. And this is a sequel to the first book, Maybe It's Us, uh, which they wrote and I read and I thought it was terrible. 
just terrible. I thought it was uh, pandering. It was if if Twitter could write a, a YA novel, here maybe it's us would be the novel that Twitter would write. Uh, totally slangy, uh, one-dimensional characters, tons and tons of virtue signaling, tons and tons of posturing and positioning in place of personality or emotional reality. I don't know if if Becky Albertalli and uh, Adam Silvestri are like that themselves, or if they think the teenagers are like that, but if teenagers are the soulless husks that inhabited uh, Maybe It's Us, then I feel I weep for the future, <laughs> to quote from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Uh, but Here's to Us is the sequel? <laughs> uh, you'd think, after all that I thought about the first one, that I wouldn't bother with the second one, but... I just can't believe, I mean, Becky Albertelli and Alvin Silvestri do really good work on their own. I can't believe that when they'd come together, they would they would create such a pile of poop. So I'm hoping that maybe the second book will be good. And I mentioned, I think I've mentioned it on this channel before, but I still haven't got to it. Uh, then what else do I have here? Oh, yes. Saga Press. Gallery book. Saga Press. It's coming out with a beautiful new hardcover illustrated edition of Michael Moorcock's quintessential fantasy book, Elric of Melnibonet. Uh, with a beautiful cover, beautiful full-color illustrations throughout. It's going to be an Elric volume really to have, uh, especially if you're an Elric fan, but I'm hoping that it won't be so pricey the libraries won't get it either. I'm hoping that it introduces, actually, a whole new group of readers to the world of Elric of Melnibone, El Michael Moorcock's great contribution to epic fantasy. Uh, but I haven't, I haven't uh, seen it yet, so I don't, I don't know quite what it looks like. Uh, then this this next one I think I've also mentioned uh, the landmark series is a collection of uh, larger size hardcovers translations of classical text plus tons and tons of maps hence the title and then tons and tons of appendices of all sorts of different uh, scholars fleshing out subjects related to the text uh, the landmark series is is well established now it started off I think with the landmark Thucydides but there's been the landmark Thucydides, uh, Herodotus, the landmark Arian, the landmark Julius Caesar, which is an amazing volume. And the next one they're doing is Xenophon. I believe it's their second Xenophon volume. And this is the Anabasis, uh, which is uh, once upon a time, back when, when well-educated people knew classical literature, the Anabasis was always a universal favorite among those readers and also a favorite among the general population. It's a terrific read. It's thrilling. That's what I'm trying to say. Is it's thrilling. It's the most winning thing that Xenophon ever wrote, and he was a really readable author. Uh, and I can just it, the, the Anabasis is also a sprawling work that that well warrants the landmark format of tons and tons of maps and tracing movements and topography studies and whatnot. Can't wait, just can't wait. Uh, and then the last one I have listed here is uh, Eaters of the Dead uh, by Kevin Wetmore. Uh, and I'm kind of blanking on it right now. I, j I jotted it down hours and hours ago, and now all I can think about is Michael Crichton's novel, Eaters of the Dead, <laughs> which is not uh, not the same thing at all. Michael Crichton, the author of Jurassic Park, wrote a book called Eaters of the Dead, which was his historical fantasia on what might have been the real-world origins of the, the epic of Beowulf. Uh, and it's it's pretty good. It's pretty good as a Michael Crichton novel goes, and it was made into a terrific movie by I think the same guy who directed Die Hard. It was called The Thirteenth Warrior. I strongly urge you to see The Thirteenth Warrior. It is amazingly good, amazingly good. But I confess I'm kind of blanking on what Kevin Wetmore's version of Eaters of the Dead is. Oh no, no, I think I do remember. I think it's a study of cannibalism of cannibalism in pop culture and also in reality, of, of, of the most famous cannibal, in fact, I'm sure of that, that is what it's called, Eaters of the Dead, uh, that is what it's called, it's a study of cannibalism, and I'm always up for a study of cannibalism, I think it's fascinating, uh, so that, I'm just going to stop with those, I could go on all day, there are more books coming out in the rest of the year than I can get to, but I'm going to try to get to all of them, but I'm going to stop just there and move on to the next prompt, so this isn't a forever tag. The next prompt is T is for toilet. <laughs> do you read in the toilet? Uh, what do you call the toilet? What would be ideal reading, the ideal reading matter for the smallest room? And uh, keep in mind here that, that I think that smallest room is an allusion to a, a quote by a critic who wrote to an author and said, I am in the smallest room in my house. I have your book before me. Soon it will be behind me. <laughs> uh, I, I, 
whenever I move to a new place, it hasn't happened in a very long time, but whenever I move to a new place, I always search for a room that's smaller than the bathroom. I like a small room to live in on my own, to be my little book room. That isn't true here. Uh, the bathroom here is the smallest room. Uh, and for the year, uh, I read in the bathroom. I call it the bathroom. I don't call it the toilet. And when, and uh, I read in there, mo mainly in, uh, I was going to say the warm seasons, spring and summer. Uh, but I don't think Boston is going to have cold seasons. So I guess that will be universal. Uh, in the uh, cold seasons, uh, just because of its positioning in the in the house, uh, the bathroom get here at Hyde Cottage gets quite chilly, so it it urges you to be about your business and and not to linger. But in the warm seasons, I don't have anything there except a pile of square bound science fiction and fantasy magazines. That's where I read them. I go through them there. I at twenty eight, you'll find that you visit the the bathroom. Quite often, <laughs> I, so I have I have those there, and I make my way through there. The only uh, variation on that pattern is if, in my normal and my non-bathroom reading life, I am so caught up in a book that I can't think about reading anything else. If I'm if I'm going to come up to a reading period, I'm going to read that book. If that happens, then that book goes in with me. But otherwise, no. Otherwise, I leave reading material in there. Uh, then the next uh, prompt is T is for Turner. Who is your favorite English painter? That would be Sir Edwin Landseer. Uh, and which is your favorite Turner painting? I'm not a big fan of Turner, but I like Fisherman at Sea. I think it's a very moody painting, uh, uh, very effective. I like it quite a bit. Uh, then T is for tea. <laughs> what is your, your preferred drink while reading? Now, I was going to get all uh, uh, self-righteous here and repeat what I've said many times on this channel, which is that you can't actually read while you're drinking. It's actually just a distraction from reading. Same thing as eating, same thing as your favorite candy, same thing as in the right mood music for your reading. But <laughs> I may have to eat a little crow on that matter. When I, the last time I, that Frida and I were visiting the, the house up in Vermont, uh, on the spur of the moment, I decided when we were out in one of the super cheap shops that they have everywhere there, it's amazing, uh, I, to get one of those metal water bottles. You fill it with water. Uh, the house up in Vermont has delicious water. I mean, you might think water has all all tastes the same, but no. If it's from a, a a nice private well, it's just not treated in any way. It's wonderful. Uh, I thought, well, you know, you you see people, especially bro tube fitness influencers on YouTube, who who tout the value of drinking from these things all the time. So why not try it? You know, try a new thing. So I got it for a dollar or whatever it was up in Vermont and filled it with water and started to really like it. I started to really, it, it, it felt good to have that right there, to wet the whistle. Uh, the only problem was that the one I got wasn't big enough. So when we, Frida and I very reluctantly trudged our way back to Boston, I got a bigger water bottle. I got this thing, which is twice the size of the one I got up in Vermont. Uh, I think this is a whole liter. Is this going to tell me? Uh, this is one, it says it's 1,000 milliliters, but I have no idea what that is. Is that a liter? Is 1,000 milliliters a liter? <sighs> anyway, uh, this I now uh, use all the time. All the time. Uh, and I have discovered something through drinking from a water bottle all day long. I've discovered something that all of the health channels, all the health books, not just the, the lying, hypocritical BroTube channels, but also every other health channel, every other health book. They've all said the same thing to me. I've been reading it and hearing it for years and discounted it. And they all said that that kind, that level of ample hydration will really make you feel better in ways that a lot of those people said would, would be hard to describe. I am now in that position. I definitely feel what they were talking about, but it would be hard for me to describe it. The closest I can come is a feeling of being well oiled, of being of being hydrated, I guess. But that's that's redundant. I don't know quite how to describe it. But boy, do you notice a difference? Boy, do you ever! I'd heard forever from those health channels that if you are ever thirsty, that's a sign that you're already dehydrated, and if your pee comes out bright yellow. That's a sign that you're dehydrated. Your pee should be the color of water. It shouldn't have any, it shouldn't, it should be so 
you should have such an excess of water that the waste products that are coming out in your pee are diluted enough so that they don't color it. Uh, I, I am now a convert to that. I, I, I don't know the science behind it. I really should learn the science behind it, but I definitely know that it makes a difference, a huge difference. But what's in that container is water. Not tea, obviously. I'm not going to do anything in that. I'm not going to put anything. I'm not going to drink anything all day long. It's going to be working in the cracks between my teeth the whole time. I'm not going to do anything like that. I'm also not going to do anything that changes my body chemistry. That helps me up. That has caffeine or anything like that. I don't want to do either one of those things. I absolutely do not understand the people, and I know so many of them, who have that much soda every day. Pure sugar. And they drink that much of it every day. They're never without it. I just can't imagine that. I can't imagine the damage that must be doing. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I, I drink water now. While I'm on my fainting couch, I drink water while I'm reading and while I'm writing. And it's delightful. <laughs> so I may have to take it back, all, all the criticism I did there. Uh, then tea is for Turkey. Have you been to Turkey? Who is your favorite Turkish writer? I have been to Turkey many, many times. I love it. Absolutely love it. An amazing, amazing country, amazing people. I wanted for nothing. At any time that I was there, I wanted for nothing. Uh, and I, that's going to sound a little cliche, but I think my favorite Turkish writer is probably Orhan Pamuk. I, he's never written a book that I didn't love. I don't imagine I could pick another Turkish writer about whom I could say that, so I'm going to say Orhan Pamuk. Uh, then T is for Tyrannosaurus Rex. What is your favorite dinosaur? What is your favorite book with a prehistoric setting? Uh, my favorite dinosaur is, of course, the T-Rex. I don't know that it's even permissible to give another kind of dinosaur. What, what are you going to say? An ankylosaur? <laughs> An Edmontosaurus? No. The T-Rex, of course, is everybody's favorite dinosaur, isn't it? And my favorite book with a prehistoric setting would be The, the uh, Dinosaur Heresies by Robert Backer. A bit of an old thing. Robert Backer's still out there. He still works the field. He still teaches students. He still writes books. Dinosaur Heresies was his sort of breakout book in which he popularized the idea that most dinosaurs were warm-blooded, or at least partially warm-blooded, uh, that they weren't swamp-dwelling, swamp cold-blooded lizards, that they were an animal of their own kind that we're learning more about. Uh, but Dinosaur Heresies is also just terrific to read, so I, I'm going to include that, even though it's nonfiction. I think probably fiction was called for here. If you think I'm going to bleed out some horrible piece of wet wash like the clan of the cave bear, you got another thing coming. Nonfiction will do it for me. Uh, then T is for Tolstoy. What is your favorite novel by Tolstoy? No offense to David Murphy, but I'm going to say War and Peace. I don't think I, Tolstoy is one of those rare, annoying authors who has two towering great works of literature to their name. Homer, of course, is the most famous example, but there are others, and Tolstoy is one of them. Uh, but as great as Anna Karenina is, War and Peace, I think, is, is easily better. Encompasses, it, it eclipses almost all novels that I know of. So I'm, I'm going to say War and Peace. Uh, then T is for theater. When was the last time you went to the theater? I had to think about this. It was here in Boston. It was, two, it was in 2004 or 2005. It was a production of Measure for Measure. And the, the reason that it stopped me when I thought about it is because I realized that's probably the last theater performance I will ever go to see. So I'm leaving the theater on a Shakespearean comedy, never my favorite thing. And I don't remember much enjoying that production here in Boston. But I don't, I don't imagine I'm ever going to do it again. So it was measure for measure. It was Shakespeare. At least I go out on Shakespeare. Uh, then the next prompt is T is for Trollope and Thackeray. Which of these two Victorian writers do you prefer? And here uh, Jim hashtags Victober, big booktube event that's going on that celebrates the literature of the Victorian era. For me, it's Trollope. Uh, even though I love Thackeray, I don't love all of Thackeray. It's not evenly distributed. I think Vanity Fair is just about one of the best books ever written. But I think that about a lot of Trollope novels. I only think about one Thackeray novel, so I, I'm going to give it to Trollope. Uh, then there are bonus prompts. I'm going to do them, and you have to as well. Okay. Uh, T is for time travel. Do you have a favorite book about time travel? For me, it would be uh, a series. Uh, a science fiction series by an author named Cage Baker about a group, a, a time traveling group who, whose mission is to go back to right before catastrophes of some kind or another and make copies of everything, create an institute library of lost knowledge so that the world at large might still think that knowledge is lost, but it's not really lost. The quintessential example being the burning of the Library of Alexandria, which actually burned a number of times, but 
the, the that's the quintessential example. What would you, what would it be like if you could go into the Library of Alexandria before the major fire that happened in the reign of uh, Cleopatra during the occupation of Julius Caesar's troops? What would happen if you could go there the week before you knew that was going to happen and just walk around the aisles using technology to scan everything, every piece of literature? And you would bring that back, and you would store that. But of course, the the uh, the company representatives encounter all sorts of adventures along the way. The Cage Baker novels. I don't think Cage Baker writes these books anymore. There's a, there was a whole bunch of them, and I really liked them. I think for inventiveness, they would probably be my favorites. Uh, then T is for teacher. Did you have a good literature teacher in school? I did. I had a couple of good literature teachers in school, not in grade school, and not in high school. God help us all. But in college. A couple. But my greatest literature teacher was not part of a school structure. The one teacher, the one who, who made the scales fall from my eyes, the one who showed me what reading was and what it could be. That teacher went from academic post to academic post, but our relationship was not academic. It was, it was teacher-student in the best sense of the word, in the most personal sense of the word. Uh, so yes and no, I guess would be my answer. But then T is for Tribble from Star Trek, The Trouble with Tribbles. Uh, what is the cutest alien in books, TV series, or movies? Uh, there's a scene in Star Trek Voyager where we flash back to Catherine Janeway uh, coming on board Voyager for the very first time. She's given a tour by an admiral who's an old friend of hers. But before she can even get off the transporter platform, he peppers her with questions like she was back at school. Uh, and one of the questions is, the bright, what's the brightest star in some certain constellation? And the first question she asks him is, seen from where? She doesn't just assume you're looking at it from Earth. And if I were to take that same approach to this question, I would say that the cutest alien is a miniature schnauzer. They're not alien to us, but they would be alien to a visitor. <laughs> but if it's not that, then I would go with Tribbles. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, then T is for tragedy. Do you have a favorite tragedy? Yes, I do. It's Shakespeare, of course, and it's, the, it's Julius Caesar for me, uh, which is my favorite Shakespeare play, and which is, plays, it, it plays a lot of interesting and intelligent games with the whole idea of what a tragedy is. I would argue that at a couple of points only in the play does it explicitly faint at what traditionally was known as tragedy. For traditional tragedy, you really want to look to Macbeth, which, aside from Oedipus Rex, is, I think, just about the purest example of a tragedy that you could find anywhere in the dramatic canon. But Julius Caesar does it for me uh, uh, for a lot of reasons that have to do with, with tragedy, but it's not, it's not as clear-cut a tragedy as, for instance, Macbeth. Uh, then T is for tag video. Do you have a favorite tag video? I love them all. I'm the king of tags. I, I have... I, I never make playlists of any of my videos, but I have done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, and probably a thousand tags. I, I, it would take for me forever to make a playlist at this point of all the tags I've done. It'd be cute. It'd be interesting to see. I wonder what the first one was. I don't have any memory of that. Uh, but uh, I love them all, so I don't, I don't have a favorite. Uh, then T is, to kill, is for To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, the novel by Harper Lee. Uh, have you read it? Did you like it? I'm going to ignore the had you read it part. I will patiently ignore that part. I did like uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. I, I think it is a complicated example of what I always say. I always say the movie adaptation is always better than the book. But the movie adaptation of To Kill a Mockingbird leaves out a lot of the book. It doesn't, doesn't condense the book little bits, only shorter. It leaves out quite a bit. So the book has some very effective scenes in it that aren't in the movie. Uh, I love the movie. Absolutely love it. But, uh, but I do love the book. Yeah, and I'm also growing in my appreciation of the alleged prequel, Ghost, Ghost Set of Watchmen. I'm, I'm, I don't, I, I haven't quite know what to think of that book. Uh, it, it set the publishing world all aflame with uh, gossip and drama when it first came out. People wondering, did Harper Lee actually write it? Did, if she did write it, how long ago did she write it? Did she want it to be published? Did her literary estate have a hand in this? Did her literary estate maybe change the book any i don't know the answer to any of those questions but i the more every time i've read i've read ghost head of watchman twice now and i liked it the second time much better than the first time and the increase happened in such a way as to make me think that i would like it even more a third time so uh, uh but i did like to kill a Markenberg, yes 
Uh, and then the uh, the final uh, prompt, T is for Twitter. <laughs> Do you find Twitter a toxic environment? Uh, everyone, every, just, just when I'm ready to say no, that like all other environments, it depends on who you have around you. I have a lot of fun on Twitter. I have a Twitter account. I have an active Twitter account. I'm all, I go there every day. I have a lot of fun. I interact with a lot of people. It's a, it's very easy on Twitter to make someone's day. It's very easy to just send them a really appreciative little note. That, that, that is not hard to do. And I have no, I know that it does pick some people up. Now I would chide those people just a bit by saying that the reason it picks you up is because you are too online <laughs> and that I'm glad that it picked up your spirits, but you really ought to limit your social media use during the day you really ought to do that uh but just when i'm ready to say no it's not all that toxic something toxic happens i, I got into a, an exchange just yesterday that grew more and more toxic as it went along it didn't start out that way i made a, a tweet about how uh in light of the news about the facebook news the scandals that have broken about facebook in the last week in light of that i made a tweet saying you know 10 years ago if all of these social media platforms that now rule the world facebook Google, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, they rule the world. And I, I made a point saying if 10 years ago all of those sites had required that you could not participate in them anonymously, that you couldn't have a fake account, that your, your account had to be linked to your provable identity, none of those problems, none of the disinformation, none of the scalding witch hunts would happen because none of the people would be brave enough to risk the consequences, legal and social. And I thought the point was self-evident, but I, someone jumped in and said, yeah, that's actually wrong. Uh, th there have been many studies that show that the sites that require a verifiable ID do worse with spamming and troll attacks and whatnot and bad behavior than sites that don't. Okay. Uh, you can just see the, per the person leaving the comment, just leaving it saying, okay, subject settled. I'm going to go on now. And I had the nerve to disagree <laughs> and said, no, that's not true. It's self-evidently obvious that if you make people accountable for what they say, they won't say half the things they say online. And the person who left the original comment did not like that at all. Like I could immediately tell the age of the person making the comment because they did not like that at all. I, I do this for a living friend. I do this for a living, comma, friend. The friend meaning hated enemy. I'm thinking about paying someone to dox you because the, I'm sure that the poster, the commenter, did, doesn't have friends and doesn't know what friendship is. It was obvious even from that second response that that was true, but it just kept going. Uh, no, uh, I actually do this for a living friend. Uh, all the studies say that this isn't true. Okay? I said, uh, I, I respect the fact that you, that you do this for a living, but you're dead wrong. It's just obvious nonsense. Obviously. It is obvious that if you made people accountable for what they do, openly, visibly, transparently, publicly accountable for what they do online, they do less rotten stuff especially less illegal stuff. No one with their name and their home address right on their account would, would make, for instance, a rape threat, a death threat. The police would be out their door in a minute. That's illegal. <laughs> of course, that would cut down on things. And also, one of my main points was it would eliminate bots. A bot can't prove that it has a street address. And half the traffic on Facebook is bots. And all they do is push misinformation. They, all they do is push lies that are designed to radicalize or misinform the public making, de-anonymizing these sites would get rid of those problems. The person wrote back, more outraged, even more outraged. And I had already guessed with the second response, I'd already guessed. In fact, I said, sort of to myself, I said, you're not going to need more than two or three more responses before you make this about race, aren't you? You're not going to. I can tell already that you're one of those people who, when you tell them not period, everything, period, is, period, about, period, race, period. Not everything is about race. I knew already that this commentator was one of those people who would hear that line and say, that is so racist. <laughs> because that's all they think about, and that's the only way they understand anything at all. The water in my bottle, the sun in the sky, everything is racist. I knew already that was the case, and sure enough, the commentator, the commentator, the next thing that she said was, well, you know, when you de-anonymize, it's marginalized and people of color who are the first victims. And I wanted to know, well, okay, but that doesn't refute what I'm saying. I don't care about the victims. 
and I don't care what happens in your estimation as a result of this. I was talking about one way to fix one problem. And we can fix other problems down the line. Uh, but apparently that was the deal breaker. <laughs> and the person said, I, I'm probably in the top 100 people most qualified to discuss this matter, and you're just dead wrong. All the studies that, I, that say that you're dead wrong. That if you de-anonymize, there'll be increased abuse, and of course all of it will be directed at marginalized people. And I responded and said, well, you know, first, uh, uh, leave, leave out your abs the absurd comment that only marginalized people experience abuse online. We'll leave that out. That's the kind of thing you want to go unchallenged. It's when you are an only racist person, then that's how you view things. No one's ever dis dis uh, discriminated against in a workplace who isn't a minority. No one's ever treated poorly in any way, even common variety rudeness, unless they're a minority. It's all about race. Everything is about race. For people like that, there's no reason, there's no way to tell them that everybody gets mistreated online. It doesn't have anything to do with your marginalized status. But in addition to that, I just kept pointing out the basic truth of what I was saying. And I, I wanted to add, you know, you haven't seen all the studies, <laughs> okay? I wouldn't make the comment if I hadn't read a few studies myself. And I'm not brandishing my, my credentials. And a couple of other people got involved, and a couple of them agreed with me. No big deal. I'm not looking for approval from strangers. And, but that incensed that original comment here even more. Firing back comments. And while those comments were happening, again, I made a prediction to myself. I said, it's not long before you start to get abusive, right? You can't handle a normal discussion with people disagreeing with you. You can't do it. You're, the, the person's original comment was speaking very slowly to me. Apparently, you didn't read my first tweet correctly. I said your comment was wrong. I had to say to them, the fact that I don't agree with you doesn't mean I don't understand you. I understand you perfectly, and I think you're wrong. Totally unthinkable to 21st century terminally online people. Totally unthinkable. Fighting words. Doxing words. And I said to myself, it's not long, you, you pulled the race card immediately, but it's not long before you get insulting here, even though no one else in this discussion is being insulting. And sure enough, she, she did. It got incredibly acerbic and uh, condescending and insulting and shut down the whole conversation. So, so that's ringing in my mind today. Otherwise, if you'd asked me yesterday, I would probably have said Twitter is not all that toxic. It depends on how you use it. You'll get exchanges like that if you put opinions out in the world. You're going to get somebody who thinks, well, I'm the, among the, the 100 most qualified people. Good Lord. <laughs> uh, you're going to get exchanges like that from time to time. But I think if you limit your Twitter, if you visit it no more than two times a day, and if you intentionally make the decision to make it positive, put a comment, I do this all the time, put a comment up there that's meant to be funny overstate something, exaggerate something, poke fun at yourself, poke fun at somebody else if you're absolutely sure they know how to take it. Uh, or when you're scrolling through your the recent uh, tweets on your feed, find a comment by somebody who's obviously a little down in the dumps and make them feel better. You can use Twitter that way, and that's a wonderful experience. I've had so many great experiences doing that. So I'm, I'm going to say it's not Twitter that's toxic. It's people who are toxic. Some Twitter users are toxic. They, I'm sure, are toxic in their own life as well. I'm positive they are. Uh, I'm not sure that I would lay the blame on Twitter. Uh, but anyway, that is the tea tag. Went on long enough, didn't it? <laughs> so, so I'm going to wrap this up. I urge all of you to do this. I don't know. Some of you are a little bit on the anal retentive side, so you won't want to do the tea tag until you've done all the tags in, leading up to it. I urge you to do that. Uh, but I will be carefully waiting for the, the concluding tags in this series. Jim has had smooth, sunny sailing for most of the alphabet leading up to T. That starts to get a little rocky with the next couple of letters, and then you get to the junk letters at the end of the English alphabet where nothing can be done, where the whole of Booktube, our little corner of Booktube, is all watching with popcorn waiting to see if it will crush Jim to do X, Y, and Z. We have a while to go, but we'll find out. I will be ready for the next tag. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.